Okay. Um, it looks like we're right at the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started today. Um, firstly, hi everyone and welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time to be here. Uh, my name is Kayla Ripple and I am a Principal Associate with the Lenfest Ocean Program. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the program, uh, the Lenfest Ocean Program is a grant making program that funds ocean and coastal research projects to address the needs facing decision makers and stakeholders. You can learn more about us and the projects we fund at lenfestocean.org. And while you're there, you can also sign up for our newsletter to receive updates on projects like this one. Uh, if you're on Twitter, be sure to follow us at Lenfest Ocean. In fact, we'll be live tweeting this webinar using the hashtag LOP webinar. So feel free to jump on there and use that too if you'd like to engage with us there. Today is the second webinar in a monthly series that highlights projects from our Climate Resilient Fisheries grant portfolio. In this portfolio, we are supporting projects where scientists are working with managers and stakeholders to better understand how climate change will impact fisheries, fisheries management, and their, their associated communities. This includes a range of topics such as predicting rain shifts of economically important fish stocks, understanding the climate vulnerability of communities that are affected by this, and providing guidance on adaptive management for fisheries, among other areas. So if you're interested to learn more about these projects specifically, my colleague Emily Knight has dropped a link to them in the chat. It's on this page too that you can also view upcoming webinars and sign up for those in the series. Uh, today, we're very excited to have joining us Dr. Malin Pinsky with University of California, Santa Cruz, and Brandon Muffley with the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Their project focused on developing near-term forecasts of species distributions in the Mid-Atlantic, although these methods could be applied in other regions. Um, I'm going to let them get into the details, but for us at Lenfest, We've really appreciated the attention to detail this team has had, both in their scientific methods, but also around the needs of managers and stakeholders who could potentially use models like these. Um, and it's because of their continued engagement and conversations with the Mid-Atlantic Council that the end product is highly relevant and uh, to potential climate resilient management approaches, which they'll be talking more about in this presentation. Um, and just before we get started, a few logistical things uh, to prevent any feedback or echoes. All attendees are muted, but we do want to hear from you. So please feel free to drop your comments or other resources in the chat box if you think they'd be useful to share with other attendees on this call. Um, we'll be dropping links to resources as well. There's a few in there already, so check those out. Um, and if you have a question for the speakers, please submit that in the question box. I'll be keeping track of those through the webinar and we'll read questions aloud at the end for Brandon and Malin to answer. Uh, if we don't get to your question or if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to us or the members of the research team after the webinar. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded. We'll distribute the link broadly afterwards. So please feel free to share this with others. And again, follow up with us if you have any questions. Um, and with that, I think that covers everything. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Malin to get us started. Great. Thanks so much for that introduction, Kayla. And thanks to everyone for joining online today. Uh, I'm Malin Pinsky, faculty at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I'm joined today by my co-PI, Brandon Muffley, at the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Right up front, I want to say that a lot of the research we'll present today was and continues to be led by Dr. Alexa Fredston. She's now Ocean Sciences faculty at University of California, Santa Cruz. So the motivation for this project is the widespread observation that climate change and variability are pushing marine species to new locations. These rain shifts in the ocean are happening nearly six times faster than on land. And this is very much an ongoing issue, not some future challenge. This graph, as one example, shows how species in the Northeast US have already shifted more than 50 kilometers north over the last few decades. As a more specific example, these maps show, show changes in the distribution of summer flounder across a 1,000 kilometer region in the Northeast US. The red colors show high biomass density in 1967. That's the map on the left. 
and in 2014, that's the map on the right. So in contrast, fisheries management historically has been largely based around the idea that stock locations are relatively stationary. So when species shift to new locations, it causes challenges for fisheries in a wide variety of ways, including the accuracy of stock assessments, the emergence of new and sometimes unregulated fisheries. There could be new bycatch problems, questions about how to allocate fishery quotas, and also novel interactions with offshore wind and other industries. So for nearly a decade, we've been collaborating with the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. And the Mid-Atlantic Council is one of eight federal fishery management councils, and one that has been especially active in thinking about preparing and adapting to climate change impacts. It's really made for a, a wonderful partnership. The Mid-Atlantic region is shown in dark blue here on your left, and fishery, federal fishery management councils are responsible for developing uh, management plans for the fisheries in their region, focused primarily on the federal waters between three and 200 nautical miles from the coast. The councils are composed of representatives from the commercial and recreational fishing sectors, as well as environmental, academic, and government interests, and they have a full-time staff as well. So council members and stakeholders in the Mid-Atlantic have been seeing changes in the water for many years now. Uh, and, and given the implications for management and, and fisheries, developed uh, an ecosystem approach to fisheries management guidance document. Uh, they developed that in 2016. The cover is shown here on your right. And it considered a, a, a variety of science related to species distribution shifts as well as management considerations. Some of the key priorities in that document included goals to develop and evaluate approaches for mid-Atlantic fisheries and their management to become more adaptive to climate change, to use models to develop short-term forecasts and medium-term projections of climate impacts, and also to identify South Atlantic species likely to become established in the mid-Atlantic or species in the mid-Atlantic that are likely to expand or shift distribution into waters under the jurisdiction of the New England Council or even of, of Canada. So far, the Mid-Atlantic Council has been using research that included end of century projections of species distributions, like the one here on the left for summer flounder, uh, or species vulnerability assessments, like the one here on the right that was led by Dr. John Hare. Um, this graph shows part of it, and it categorizes species into low to up, all the way up to very high potential for distribution shifts. So research like this has been really informative for the council, um, but it's primarily been used in a strategic way, um, such as to inform the EAFM guidance document I just showed you on a previous slide, or to identify research and management priorities for the stocks that were identified as being especially climate vulnerable. On the other hand, fishery, fishery managers really make decisions each year. Um, it's often based on stock assessments that project, that often projects stock conditions over the next one to five years. So it's really a mismatch in time scales between the multi-decadal or end of century time scales uh, of the available information on climate impacts and these very short time horizons for fisheries management decision making. So to address that need, our project is specifically about making near-term forecasts of species distribution shifts. By near-term, we mean one to 10 years into the future. And these are all about making quantitative predictions since the ultimate test of whether we understand rain shifts is being able to predict them accurately. One to 10 years is a time scale over which we have data for directly testing the accuracy of predictions and precision of our predictions. And it also allows us to refine our understanding for the oceanographic and the biological mechanisms that actually are driving range shifts. So there's an important scientific goal there as well. This is also a critical time scale for fisheries management. Near-term forecasts may be able to directly inform tactical decisions from one year to the next, not just strategic considerations. And also uh, these kinds of forecasts may enable long-term climate adaptation through small climate adaptation steps along the way. 
So this project has three main components. First is to develop and test retrospective forecasts of species distributions from what are called dynamic range models. So dynamic range models explicitly consider demographic processes like recruitment and dispersal and mortality and are likely to be more effective for short-term forecasts, but that's what we're trying to test. Retrospective forecasts are those that start from some time in the past, like the year 2006. The benefit is that we can then compare our forecasts against observations of what actually happened in 2007, 2008, and after. A second goal is to make the tools for these models openly available for wider use. We've received a lot of interest in these methods, and it really will require a collaborative community of researchers and managers to continue developing them. And we really welcome that collaboration. And finally, we're learning how to make these, how these forecasts might be incorporated into management decisions. It's not only that scientists need to learn how to make forecasts, but managers are also learning how to use forecasts of species distributions. And it is a very collaborative process with learning in both direction. And interactions with the Mid-Atlantic Council and with fishery stakeholders has been a central part of this project. So as we got into our project, we also found it important to state up front what we are not doing. Uh, first, while we're testing forecast methods, we're actually, we are not actually producing forecasts for the future, 2024, 2025 or beyond. So in addition, this was a research project to develop tools. Actually operationalizing this forecast system for routine use would require future development. And third, we are focused on the spatial distribution of species, not focused on stock abundance. So we're not trying to produce a stock assessment. And finally, we're not producing direct management advice. Instead, we're developing tools that could help the Mid-Atlantic Council make more effective decisions. So that brings us to our central questions. First, can dynamic range models forecast changes in species distributions? Second, how far into the future do those forecasts have skill? And does the skill of those forecasts improve when we consider the impacts of fishing pressure? So in close collaboration with Brandon, we identified summer flounder as a species for us to test our forecasting methods. This was a choice based in part on data availability and the Mid-Atlantic Council's interest in past shifts of this species. The uh, species used to be centered off Virginia in the 1960s and now is most abundant off New Jersey, New York, and into Rhode Island. So summer flounder are a bottom-dwelling flat fish. It's a, they support valuable commercial and recreational fisheries on the East Coast. The adults migrate inshore and offshore seasonally, and they produce pelagic, so larvae that are in the water column. But then they, those larvae settle into estuaries. Uh, as they continue to mature, and then they move out onto the continental shelf as they age. They become reproductively mature at age two to three, and the adults feed on a wide range of fish and crustaceans. They're an important part of the continental shelf food chain. So uh, not to spoil too much, but I want to give you some of the punchlines right up front. They include that distributions of summer flounder have varied both north and south through time. This isn't a case of simple marching north over the years. The dynamic range models that consider demographic processes do have uh, some skill at forecasting distribution shifts. And these dynamic range models outperform standard species distribution models and also very simple persistence forecasts. So I, I, I really do think they're an exciting tool to continue developing in the, in the future. So our, our basic approach uh, for this project was to fit dynamic range models to bottom trawl survey data from 1972 to 2006, and then to forecast them forward for 2007 to 2016. And then we tested those forecasts against observations, again, from bottom trawl surveys from those same years. We used uh, an age-structured dynamic range model in which individuals survived or died each year as they got older. 
with adults contributing to the next generation through self-recruitment. These dynamics occurred in one degree latitudinal bands, and they're replicated across latitudinal bands in the Northeast with larval dispersal and or adult movement between these bands to allow rain shifts. The demographic rates could be temp temperature dependent, and that could be recruitment, or it could be mortality, or adult movement. We could also include annual variation in recruitment. We could include observed fishing mortality, so that could vary uh, by age and by year. We could fit the model to length observations, and we could include a stock recruitment relationship, so also known as density dependence. We could also turn each of those options on or off. So the model is coded in a uh, scientific programming language called STAN. It's a, what's technically called a hierarchical Bayesian model. And it means that we modeled the observation process separately from the true but unobserved demographic dynamics. We used temperature data from oceanographic observations and fishery fishing mortality from the stock assessment. This model is actually very rigid, has, despite being able to turn on a number of options, it has very little flexibility compared to a traditional species distribution model. We did also fit a species distribution model, what's called a generalized additive model. It's a common statistical approach to um, standard species distribution models. And we also compared results against what's called a persistence forecast. And that's just where you assume the uh, species doesn't move through time. So on this first question, I first wanna show you an example. So in this plot, the red line is the observed position of the range centroid for summer flounder in the Northeast US during the forecasting period. So the model had already been fit to previous years as, and now was forecasting forward. In the red line, the observations, we see some movement north during sort of 2011 to 2013, but actually no overall trend during this particular decade. The forecast from the temperature dependent recruitment model uh, is shown in blue with the lightest blue showing the 95, uh, 95th percentile confidence bands. So the first highlight is that all of the red dots fall within the confidence bands of the model. So it suggests we're getting the confidence bands about right. In addition, the model actually does a reasonably good job forecasting a slight northward shift in 2010 through 2013, though it does miss some of the other fluctuations and also doesn't get the large magnitude, at least that shows up in the observations. We do have to remember though, that some of the observed fluctuations may actually be observation noise rather than a real shift. So um, what the model is reconstructing as true dynamics may actually be closer to what happened out, on, out in the water. So we can then compare uh, the model against a generalized additive model. So that's just a standard species distribution model that's shown in purple. Uh, if anything, that uh, generalized additive model or GAM gets the variability through time in the wrong direction. It forecasts a southward shift in 2010 through 2012 when the stock instead shifted a bit north. And uh, the persistence forecast, just a no change, is shown in green. So a more formal model comparison can examine what's called root mean square error. So more error to your right uh, means worse performance of, of the forecast. Uh, we see that the traditional species distribution model, the, the GAM is doing the worst. It's got the highest root mean square error. Whereas the dynamic range models, especially those with temperature dependent recruitment are some of the best performing models. Uh, if you're curious, some of the other terms after the model name indicate whether or not the model had observed fishing mortality, that's an F. Uh, a stock recruit or density dependence relationship, that's indicated with SR or whether it had annually varying recruitment, otherwise known as process error and indicated with a, a PE. You'll also notice that at least for the range centroid, the simple persistence forecast, um, I guessing that the stock doesn't move, does quite well in this decade, though it's outperformed a bit by the dynamic range, some of the dynamic range models. 
If we look at other metrics of skill, like forecasts of the cold or northern range edge position here on your left, or the warm or southern range edge position here on the right, uh, we see that the traditional species distribution model consistently has high error. And models with temperature dependent recruitment consistently have pretty low error. Uh, they're the lowest error in both cases and do okay, depending on exactly how that model is formulated. They do pretty well um, in all cases. When we look at forecast skill through time, one of the clearest signals is that our forecast error bounds increase dramatically as we forecast further into the, into the future. That makes a lot of sense and accurately represents that our, our skill and our precision degrades with time. In terms of fishing, um, we found that it does help improve forecasts, particularly for population dynamics through time, but also to some extent for range dynamics. And it's a good indication that fishing mortality remains an important part of these species population dynamics across through time and across space. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Brandon, to talk about the research applications and what we learned through our years of engagement with the council and with the, the fisheries community. Great, Thank, thanks, Malin. So as, as Malin and Kayla had, had indicated, another component of, of this project was really trying to make the connection of science and management. And, and we wanted to do so with a concerted effort to engage and interact with relevant management, science, and stakeholder groups. And I think one of the things that made this project fairly unique is that you know I was a co-PI on this project as a council staff member and really to make sure that we were making those connections and bridging the gap between scientific advancements and what the potential management reality might be with this kind of information. So we spent a lot of time early on developing a plan to engage the council and not just council members themselves, but the different advisory bodies that support the council. So both stakeholders and our science bodies, our scientific and statistical committee. So of course, we, we put a plan together. We held our first kickoff webinar uh, about the project in December of 2019, and we were really about to get things going. And then of course, COVID happened, and we sort of had to throw out our initial plans for how we were gonna conduct our engagement and sort of rethink our process for, for going about doing this and, and sort of the timing and approach. But we did decide to engage and collaborate with the Council's Ecosystem and Ocean Planning Committee and their advisory panel. This committee and AP are, is probably our most diverse group within the Council process, where we have commercial and recreational fishing representatives, NGOs, academia. And this allowed us really to get a variety of perspectives on the project. And at the time this project got started, our EOP committee and AP had just finished going through our initial development of an EAFM risk assessment. And, and so they were sort of used to going through challenging ecosystem and climate projects and getting folks to think about things a little bit differently and how we might approach risk and the associated uh, issues resulting from climate change including stock distribution changes. So we had a good group that was ready to go and, and tackle sort of these particular complex issues that we're facing that this project was looking to address. And, and through that EAFM risk assessment process, we had learned a lot about how to engage stakeholders through that. You know, initially, uh, a number of the folks through that process were skepti skeptical about the project and, and, you know, because there was a lot of concern and unknown about what the end product was going to mean. And to get directly, you know, what does it mean from a quota perspective, right? So there's all of these new things as we think about climate science, what it ultimately means from, a, you know, council action and their primary, you know, duties are to set specifications. And so what we learned from that process is that you can't just drop something new and different on stakeholders and expect them to be to you know buy into what you're actually trying to do. So next slide. So we decided uh, to make sure that we were going to check in with our ecosystem and ocean planning committee and AP at different times and key times throughout the project. So as I mentioned, we we held a kickoff meeting 
uh, at the start of the project to introduce the project goals and objectives. We held a check-in sort of midway through the project to present on where we were with progress, show some initial results and get some feedback for where we may want to change some things. And then we re regrouped at the end of the project to present on model development, our preliminary results and the outputs that we were getting for Summer Flounder and get some initial thoughts on the potential use and application of these models and how we can utilize the information that, may, that they may provide. As I indicated, we also presented to the Council Scientific and Statistical Committee. This is the group that provides science advice to the councils. Um, and when we presented to them, we got into a little bit more of the weeds of the, the model structure and the data elements and the application. But they were able to provide you know, us some, some technical guidance, but they also thought about how we could utilize this information from both a science perspective. How could the SSC utilize this information? And they provided some insights in terms of how we could utilize this from a management perspective. And finally, we took all of this feedback that we did receive from these groups and we presented the project results for input to the council for council consideration. And we wanted to get their feedback on where they thought this kind of information could be applied in the future. And I'll talk about those applications in the next couple of slides. So next slide. So, um, before I get into the actual potential applications, I just wanted to, you know, touch upon a few quick points in regards to our engagement takeaways. Um, I think we all know that fishery science and fisheries management isn't an easy process, and folks aren't necessarily on the same page. We all have different backgrounds and perspectives and familiarity with different issues. And I think this is particularly true when it comes to climate and ecosystem context, con contextual information. It's really challenging to sort of put all of these pieces together, really new and innovative science and tying that to a really complex management issue that you're facing. So I think you really need to be committed to engagement. And that in in includes engagement throughout the entire project, of course, but I think it also requires commitment post-project. So how do we take where we are now, how do we continue to sort of engage with folks on this research as it continues to get updated and refined and as we get closer to some direct management application. And of course, engagement can be challenging, uh, particularly when the issues are challenging, but I think you need to work through those challenges because I think it allows more buy-in at the end of the process. And like I said, new science, particularly in the area of climate and ecosystem science, I think can raise some, some questions and uncertainty uh, as to what the results are actually gonna mean and how we may utilize those. Again, people immediately think, how is this information going to impact what those quotas are and what my opportunities out on the water are? Even though we're not there yet, um, that's where people immediately go. And so I think, Taking the time to think through those, we needed to rethink how to how we communicated um, this project to stakeholders and to managers, and how and what kind of information and results um, can be presented. How do we want to go about presenting that? Um, we need to want we wanted to ensure we are taking the feedback and identifying what we were and were not doing with this project and what we could and could not address uh, given the current scope of the project. So I think just being honest with folks about what we can and cannot do and where this is actually going, I think is really important as well. And ultimately, I think going through this really deliberative process with stakeholders and managers was a really positive approach and I think resulted in the project being wide, widely supported. Um, we got a lot of good feedback from all of the groups that we engaged in. Um, regarding data availability, potential collaborators in the future, um, and ideas and opportunities on how we can utilize this information on the potential outputs. So next slide. And so I'm not going to go through this slide in detail, but when we first started this project, we uh, the the group sort of sat around and identified where we thought some of the potential applications of this of this project would be. Um, and so we had a strong emphasis on thinking about the management side of things, uh, particularly given the council's previous 
engagement and interest in this type of research. Um, again, I have a number of examples here, um, both from a management and science perspective, and how we could utilize this both in a strategical and tactical way. Um, but we also recognize that the potential application of this information is likely to be different across species and depending upon the issue you're looking to utilize the, this for. So there's really no uh, sort of one size fits all approach. So you may apply it if you're thinking about um, allocation issues versus marine spatial planning, even if it's for the same species, you are likely to utilize this information differently. So next, I'm going to get into sort of the feedback that we actually did get back from stakeholders and managers on where they thought this information could be useful for them. Next slide. So thankfully, many of the applications the project team sort of considered when we first got the project started, they were raised and suggested by stakeholders, RSSC, and the council. So again, I'm just providing a few examples here of some of the areas that we've identified and where this could be applied. And I don't plan in to go into detail on each of these. I think we could spend a good amount of time on each of these particular sub bullets. But we did get feedback that this project and modeling approach and those potential outputs could have a variety of application from both tactical use in council actions and considerations to strategic planning and priority setting, and then science considerations within our stock assessment process. So for management actions, the, the council, had, the Mid-Atlantic Council has begun to consider and utilize stock biomass distributions as a factor for allocation decisions. And certainly information like this could help support and advance those types of considerations in the future. Another management application from this type of research is to provide an evaluation on the effectiveness of recreational management measures. So the recreational sector is certainly less mobile than the commercial sector. So as stocks are moved both interannually and the sort of these longer underlying distribution changes, the efficacy of recreational management measures can change as the availability of, of a stock changes uh, its position along the coast. And certainly there's a lot of application within the various components of the Council's EAFM guidance document. Uh, and there's this and there's a lot of work um, recently, sort of an ongoing effort into, into developing adaptive and climate ready governance and management strategies. Um, well, I use the word, you know, sort of to increase the council's adaptive capacity so that the management process can incorporate this, this kind of information into its management decisions. And lastly, we got feedback that this kind of information could help inform our stock assessment process from a variety of ways. So given the structure of the model that was developed here, one area actually identified by our council was the potential to look at spatially explicit fishing mortality. Um, so it, stock assessments within our region, um, black sea bass is a, re is a recent example where we are beginning to look at uh, movement amongst the stocks. And you know the, we have the potential here to partition and think about um, spatially explicit F instead of applying F across the entire stock, stock complex. And so thinking through fishing mortality that way certainly could be a big change for how we currently manage our, our fisheries. And so that's, again, just a quick overview of some of the feedback that we got. Again, I think it was really positive in terms of the scope and types of activities that we would utilize this information. And uh, so I'm really excited about where this potentially may go. And I think that's where we're gonna go next with our presentation. So I'm gonna turn it over to Malin and we're gonna talk about sort of next steps where we see the next steps of this project. Great, thanks Brandon. Yeah, the, the interaction and how much we learned from the, the council and the stakeholders really helped guide a lot of where this project went and also where we plan to take it in the, in the future. We, Brandon, I just wanted to end by talking a, a little bit about what's next or what we, we see as next for near-term forecasts of species distributions um, and fisheries man management, both from our team, but also thinking about this more, more broadly. So first on the, on the research side, 
Um, we're continuing to improve the documentation of the dynamic range model methods that we that we've developed as part of this project. Uh, we have a preprint publication that I expect will be available within the next week or so. Uh, a peer reviewed publication coming up after that, and also open source code in the uh, scientific coding languages R and Stan available soon on GitHub. Um, I expect the GitHub repository that it, it's, uh, whose address is listed here um, should be available next next month. I'd really encourage uh, folks who are interested in helping advance the statistical and technical side of that to, to get in touch. Second, we're actively expanding the model for application to other, other species. Um, Brandon mentioned black sea bass on the East Coast, so that's one, one focus. Also Dungeness crab on the West Coast. And with each application, we're learning a lot. Um, each species is different. Each management application is different as well. We're adding more model features to match a wider range of species biologies and ecologies. So some of those examples include asymmetrical thermal performance curves, uh, demographic responses to oxygen, to pH or to upwelling. And I think more broadly, sort of advancing these methods and the forecast tools is going to take a lot more than uh, one research group. So I'd really encourage anyone who's listening to think about ways that they could um, apply these methods in, in their own work or own area of expertise and contribute to this broader community that we're trying to develop. And like I said, please do be in touch if you're interested in helping. And finally, our application of dy dynamic range models so far has used observed ocean conditions to forecast species distribution changes from the past. Now, these were, as I mentioned, these are retrospective forecasts that we were doing. And that was really to test the, the ecological modeling approach. So to actually make forecasts of the future, we need corresponding forecasts of future ocean conditions. And that there are a range of methods for doing that. Some of them are statistical, they're also dynamic, what are called dynamical oceanographic models. Um, and these are not at all simple to make. Um, they really depend on uh, accurately representing oceanographic conditions right now. Um, Nearshore oceanographic uh, processes are chaotic. And so that accurate representation, representation of current conditions is both difficult and also very important. This is an area though, where NOAA's Climate Ecosystem and Fisheries Initiative, often called CEFI, is making a lot of progress. Um, and these kinds of forecasts I expect to start to become available in the in the coming years. So I'll let Brandon talk about next steps for the application of these methods. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Malin. So I from my perspective, certainly to me, the, the critical component on the application on the management side is to continue to support and stay engaged on the application on the research side of things. As Malin had indicated, I think there's there's more work to be done here. There's lots of interesting areas that this can go. And I think we as council staff and managers need to stay engaged and connected to that so that we can continue to provide our input in terms of how this information can be geared towards management decisions and making sure it's relevant to to those management decisions. So I see sort of the immediate next steps for us is staying engaged with with Malin and other folks that are interested in this this type of of research, making some of those connections through this project. We stakeholders identified connections for other species that we may be interested in applying these um, these types of approaches to. So allowing, you know, connecting to industry members or other scientists, you know, we have different connections maybe than what some, some academia and other uh, parties may have. So bringing those folks together to talk through these things, I think is really critical. And then identifying those, those management opportunities with the research team. And then sort of, I had indicated this earlier, there's a lot of climate ready fisheries management stuff going on, right? There's this synergy around making um, management sort, sort of 
um, climate ready um, and responding to climate change, again, building their adaptive capacity to deal with this kind of uh, Malin had already mentioned the, the CEFI work that's taking place. I think that's going to be a really critical component to all of this, in, you know, connecting the models that we have here with oceanographic conditions so that we can make these, these short-term forecasts so that we can utilize that information that way. Uh, there's a lot of action and activity going on with the Inflation Reduction Act. Again, tying climate and ecosystem drivers and making that information tied to management action. And I think this project and this kind of information has a lot of relevance there. Our East Coast, uh, we've conducted uh, all three Atlantic Coast Councils and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, along with NOAA Fisheries, recently finished their East Coast um, scenario planning, and they've identified a number of outcomes and next steps there. And this climate coordination group that sort of was formed as a result of the scenario planning project, helping support those activities out of that, I think, is where this project could have a lot of direct sort of science application to inform those management decisions. And of course, I think there's a lot of information here within our EAFM guidance document, our risk assessment. So there's a lot of different areas that I'm already thinking about how we could pull this kind of information within our EAFM process. And I don't want to lose um, sort of the importance of what Malin had started with in his research application, making it open access. Because if it's going to expand to other species, if we're going to tie it into the stock assessment process where I think it could have a lot of application, making that open source so that other folks can pick it up and think about its application to other species is going to be really critical as we continue to move forward and apply it within a broader management context. So all of those things, making sure we stay engaged, I think is going to be really critical as part of the next steps within this project. So uh, with that, I just want to thank, say thanks so much for listening. Um, I just want to acknowledge again that this project has been led in most ways by Dr. Alexa Fredston, who's now at University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, also, a huge thanks to collaborators, Dan Avando, Jim Thorson, Jude Kong, and Emily Moberg. And finally, this project never would have happened without the support and the vision of the Lenfest Ocean Program. So uh, huge thanks there as well. Um, I think we do have time for questions, though please don't hesitate to reach out to either me or to Brandon, if you have any follow-up questions that aren't addressed today or if you're interested in collaborating. Yeah, fantastic. Wow, thank you. Thank you both so much. That was, this has always been an interesting project to hear updates on, and I really appreciate your insights into the results and also how this can be useful in fisheries management moving forward. Um, so definitely reach out if you have some thoughts on or questions about how to continue engaging with this research. Um, I also noticed that we have a few questions in the chat, which I will read aloud um, and either one of you can answer. Uh, the first one I think sort of gets at one of your next steps that you were talking about, Malin, at the end of the presentation. Um, but in terms of forecasting the distribution and abundance of marine fish species under changing ocean conditions, one of the needs to have reliable forecasts of the oceanographic factors that drive the distribution and abundance of species. Um, are there reliable physical oceanographic forecasting products available to the researchers on the mid-Atlantic coast? And if so, how would uncertainty in those projections be quantified with dynamic range models? Um, there's a second part of the question, but I'll ask that after after this. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. It, it lines up well with what I mentioned about um, incorporating, it, especially longer term forecasts, into um, a next step of making making these dynamic range model forecasts more operational. Um, there are uh, sort of uh, multi day to weekly forecasts available, and there are a number of um, projects in the pipeline that are uh, oceanographic products in the pipeline that are making um, decent longer term forecasts as well. Um, making those operational, I know, is uh, part of the climate ecosystem and fisheries initiative uh, initiative plan. So I recommend following what's happening, happening there. Um, in terms of accounting for uncertainty, that's 
that depends, at least oceanographic uncertainty, that depends a lot on the exactly how the oceanographic products are being developed. Um, there are well-developed methods in terms of perturbing the initial conditions and then getting a range of oceanographic forecasts. And if those are available, that's very easy to incorporate into the dynamic range model forecasts. Um, the dynamic range models run very quickly. Um, the uncertainty in the demographic relationships in the dynamic range models are also easy to incorporate just by sampling from the Bayesian posteriors of the uh, of the models as they're fit to the historical data. So uncertainty is an important part of decision making. And on the dynamic range model side, it's straightforward to incorporate. Great, thank you. And the second part of that question is more for you, Brandon, I think. Um, how does the council perceive the potential for these forecasts in the face of uncertainty in both dynamic range models and oceanographic uncertainties? Yeah, no. I so, I mean, I think I was really um, pleased when we actually presented to the, the council themselves, we had gone through the process with all of our stakeholders and our SSC to sort of think through um, some of the challenges that we have or some of the uncertainties that Malin was just touching upon there and how we could actually apply it. And the council had thought through a lot of different ways, I think, that we could utilize this information. Again, I, you know, we, through our EAFM guidance document that was done, uh, all, you know, eight years ago now, they were thinking about and looking to have these short-term, you know, near-term uh, projections to help them, to help guide them in their management decisions. They understood sort of these uncertainties and trying to understand how stocks are moving around within these shorter term time windows when they are making actual management decisions. So they wanted this kind of information to help them um, with their decisions. How we actually go about doing that, again, I think we, we've come up with a lot of different areas and ideas of where we could fit this in some i think in again very easily within some of our sort of strategic planning and priority setting processes how we actually get it then into the more tactical making decisions about um, catch limits or allocation decisions or management effectiveness i think those we I think we have a path of where those that information could go, but you know, some work still work still needs to take place to actually go about doing that. And so I think the council is really interested in this kind of work and actually sort of as a direct way to incorporate climate and ecosystem information directly into management decisions that have some actual, you know, true application in terms of the decisions decisions that they're making. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, did the council or SSC say anything about where this fits in with BSIA? Um, I think that's best scientific information available. Uh, no, I mean, I don't think so. I can't recall like any explicit discussions about that per se. Again, I think, you know, the focus of this was thinking through um, a, trying to understand what kind of information these kinds of models can give us and sort of how well and how reliable that kind of information can be. And then given all of that, how do we incorporate that information into these different components that we're thinking about? So I don't think, you know, they went so far as to say, okay, if, if we start utilizing those, you know, where does that fit into the context of BSIA or... Um, so certainly as we begin to operationalize this kind of information, I think we'll have to start thinking through that a little bit in a little bit more detail, particularly our SSC, depending upon how they might utilize this information. But I don't think they got that far in terms of thinking through that. Again, they were identifying data sources. They identified some data uncertainties that we may have with the model or where areas that they raised questions about uh, the data that were being used and the other data that we should be thinking about utilizing in these kinds of models, but not in the context of BSIA did we sort of get into that level of discussion. Great, thank you. Um, 
Do you find it interesting, the possibility of engaging with ocean acidification and sea urchin fisheries with this kind of work? Yeah, it sounds really interesting. Um, I We've started thinking about ocean acidification a little bit in the context of Dungeness crab, just based on the some of the experimental work suggesting that the larvae are quite sensitive to ocean acidification. Um, so it'd be interesting to also think about that in the context of, of other species. Um, I guess more broadly, one of the requirements for starting to apply these methods more broadly are um, data on historical species distributions and the changes through time. Um, because that, that observation of how species have responded to historical climate variability allows us to and in effect, train the models and therefore start to make these, these forecasts. Thank you. Um, we had a similar question to this, um, more so talking about how this could be applied to other species, um, but also how applicable these methods were for high, highly migratory species. And so I'm wondering if you could speak a little more to those ones. Yeah, um, so I, I talked a little bit about data. Um, exactly how how much or how little data are needed to make accurate forecasts, uh, we don't know yet. I mean, it's gonna take more applications and um, sort of focused, focused effort to, to figure that out. Um, the, for many marine species, uh, a lot more data through time are available than uh, are available for species on land, which is kind of astounding. Um, a lot of the survey, species that are surveyed, um, especially species that are of interest for fisheries, um, have pretty good historical data. Plenty of issues as well, but uh, uh, it is pretty amazing. Uh, for highly migratory species, I think the, the important question really comes down to what are the key demographic processes that are um, guiding uh, changes in distribution? So behavior and behavioral choices um, made by the species may be more important. So the, I, I didn't talk much about the movement model that we've, we've developed so far, but it's, it's uh, built under the assumption that species move towards uh, environmental conditions that are more suitable for them. So it does have some component of behavior in there already um, that might be applicable to highly migratory species. I think we'd have to think carefully about time scales. We built this as a so far, it's as an and as an annual model, but there's no reason it can't be developed into a finer time scale and a application to a highly migratory species where seasons or even finer scale behavior is is more important. Cool. Uh, we're gonna stay in this thread um, because there's there seems to be a lot of questions about other species that this could be applied to. Um, so this person works specifically in the New England area and studies kelp distribution um, and is wondering if these kinds of models would be useful for kelp or other sessil species. Yeah, I'm so excited to hear interest in applying this to other species because I really think that's what we what we need. Um, yes, I think this would work really could work really well for kelp. Um, you can sort of you can ignore adult movement. So in some ways that makes it easier and uh, instead just think about larval dispersal and how that will then seed new populations nearby and then think about growth and mortality and reproduction from there. So I think kelp would work out really well. Um, in cases where kelp can be remotely sensed, that's a really cool different uh, data set that would be available for historical distributions. Great. Um, our next question is things like temperature and larval dispersal are strongly controlled by local circulation. Are these DRMs easily combined with physical oceanographic models in some way? So the, there, I, I think the question is going specifically at uh, questions of larval dispersal and how that may transport larvae uh, preferentially in one direction or uh, between certain patches. And so underlying the, at least the current impl implementation of the, these dynamic range models, there's a migration matrix, um, which has 
uh, migration between each of the uh, demographic patches that we're, that we're modeling. So at the moment we've done for the summer flounder, we use this super simple one where they just move between adjacent patches. But you can imagine using a physical oceanographic model to inform that and also constrain it in really interesting ways so that they, there can be movement between more distant, distant patches or it's biased in certain directions based on oceanographic currents. Um, so that would be actually pretty straightforward to incorporate into the current structure in the way that we've coded that up. I think that'd be a really, it'd be a nice way to test the importance of um, larval transport and oceanography on driving larval transport and to, to what extent that's uh, helping drive historical and future uh, changes in species distributions. Great. Um, all right, very nice work, Malin and Brandon. It's likely that responses to temperature are pretty different on the warm and cool edges of the distribution. One can get a feel for why by looking at temperature response curve shape. Is the DRM approach capable of capturing something like this, or can such a dynamic be left unresolved for the applications you're currently considering? Yeah, oh, thanks so much for that question. Because this is actually exactly why, these kinds of questions are exactly why I'm so excited about dynamic range models. Because they're representing the underlying demographic rates and their response to environmental conditions, it's much more straightforward to incorporate uh, those differences between the different range edges. You know, you might expect that uh, dispersal is what's really important at controlling the, red, uh, the rate of range expansion at a leading edge, um, whereas potentially mortality or um, reproduction is going to be important for how long those trailing edges are maintained in the face of uh, unsuitable uh, environmental conditions. So the model we've already coded up has some of those different processes as well, but it's quite straightforward to start incorporating other kinds of hypotheses um, into them if if other hypotheses are are relevant for leading and trailing edges. I already I did mention that we've uh, started implementing asymmetric thermal performance curves um, in terms of response of growth or mortality or recruitment. Um, that already starts to get at some of that. And, and I would just add from a, not from the scientific perspective, but this leading and trailing edge sort of information that came out as one of the areas of interest um, from a, from an application perspective or from a management perspective. Should we, are there unique dynamics within those leading or trailing edges? Should we be protecting or doing something differently for those animals that are, you know, sort of leading the way or staying behind, you know, so sort of thinking through some of the management application and the unique sort of um, characteristics of those species, I think is something that um, management has also been thinking about through this project as well. Great, and we have time for one more question, um, which is great because that's the only one we have left. Uh, is this project open to share guidelines and or collaborations with the research initiatives in LATAM Latin America? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk more. Um, there's some really interesting possibilities for application. Fantastic. All right, well, we've gotten through all of the questions. So thank you both again so much for your time today. Um, this has been a fantastic presentation. For everyone who's still on, we'll be sending a link to this recording um, shortly afterwards. And we'll also be including the links that we shared in the chat as well during the webinar. And we'll also be following up with any new updates um, such as publications or the, was it GitHub, that the new information that's coming out next month. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us and thanks Brandon and Maylin for, for your work with this. All right, with that. We'll thanks so much. Thanks for the wonderful questions. Thanks Bye, everyone. everyone. Thanks.